here, but my name is Kayla Anderson. Um, I have been teaching for UIUI online since 2014. I teach a Foundations English 301 class, um, and then I also work as a dean with the English Holy Sci group um, and Spanish language group. Um, and then my other professional life, I'm starting my 13th year teaching secondary ed English high school seniors, which are great and way less intimidating than you guys. <laughs> but that's all right, we'll, we'll go with it. So um, as you can tell, like, like all of you, I'm very busy and I'm really interested in how do I get more done with less effort. And this phrase, get her done, this is something my mom used to say when I was a kid, uh, usually connected to Saturday chores or something <laughs> that we didn't want to do. She'd be like, well, get her done, right? It's got to happen. So now as my siblings and I have become adults, um, we joke with this statement, and usually when we have something to do when we're all together, somebody inevitably will throw this out in a terrible Western accent. Um, but it does speak to something a little bit bigger, which is this idea of getting things done and this sort of task-driven life, and, and we're all leading that and interested in how to do that a little bit better. Most of my notes come from a book um, by Charles Duhigg, if you're really interested in him. He wrote The Power of Habit, which is exceptional, um, but this book is called Smarter, Faster, Better. Um, so if you're really interested in some of the concepts here, uh, he is the author of those two works, which are great. Um, so the first thing I want you to do, just in the corner of your notes or on your computer if you're taking notes, or if you need a scratch paper, I have some, but I want you to, for two minutes, write down what a productive day for you looks like. So at the end of the day, if you're going to bed and you're like, I was really productive today, what is that what you like? What did you do during the day that made you feel productive? You can do it however you want. You can just list tasks that you would have maybe gotten done, um, or you can kind of go in the morning, I was able to do this, I got up on time, right? Like, what is it that at the end of the day makes you feel productive? So we take about two minutes and just think of a productive day. So let's just see collectively what productivity looks like. So if you had something on your list that was work-related, so connected to your employment, raise your hand, I'm pretty sure that's probably all of us, right? Okay, what about uh, things that are connected to you, like, house maintenance or family maintenance, right? That's productivity. Did anybody do anything social? So like an hour of Netflix is productivity. Is it? I don't know. What about um, something connected to you, like a personal goal? So maybe you're trying to write a novel like I've been doing for 12 years, right? No? Yeah, something like that. Okay. So I think the first step in really thinking about productivity is redefining what productivity is. I think that when you'll see the research that an hour of television can actually make us sometimes a little more productive because our brain needs a little bit of downtime, or maybe that's not productivity for you, or social things need to be built into our productivity. Often we think of productivity as just a list of tasks, but I think the definition is much more broad. Yes? So it's still effective like while you're doing the dishes? Oh, yeah, probably. I feel guilty for that once. I do dishes while I'm doing the dishes, and then I go to get something done, but I also have to do it. But do you always have to be getting something done? Yes. <laughs> 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 All right, so um, in communication theory, they talk a lot about the roles people take in groups, and there are three types. There are task maintenance and disruptive, and I'm not going to talk about disruptive, because none of us are disrupted people in groups, right? We're not the clowns or the, or the sabotage uh, people. We're, we're probably more the task or the maintenance. So a task-minded person will get into a group and they focus on getting the job done. Whatever the group has been assigned or whatever the job is, they want to get it done. The maintenance people are more about how the group feels. So they're worried that people's feelings are hurt in the group, or that not everybody is having the opportunity to share, or that the tension of the group is too much and they, they crack a joke to harmonize it a little bit. And I found that truly driven, productive people often fall into a task role. I fall into a task role. I could care less if we like each other in a group. Let's just get the job done, right? Like, that's, that's how it is. And, and I get into a group and that the balance is better, right? The goal in communication theory, they say, is to have a balance between being a maintenance person and a task person and being able to balance that. But I found that 
people interested in productivity are usually task driven. How many would say you're probably more interested in the task? Do we have any harmonizers or maintenance people? Good. We, we love having those people in groups. They help so much. Um, but this idea of like focusing on a task all the time really carries over, I think, into our personal life because we do that in a group and then we take that over and carry that into our uh, personal life where sometimes we don't take the time to maybe focus on the relationship with ourselves, right? Maybe maintaining the things that we need to do to keep going to accomplish all of those tasks. Um, so I'm really interested in that and how task roles carry over personally. And if you have anything to share, please let me know if anything speaks to you um, this way. So um, when we think about productivity, um, this is the definition that the author gives, which I really like. He says, it's the name we give our attempts to figure out the best use of our energy, intellect, and time as we try to seize the most meaningful rewards with the least wasted effort. Anything in there stand out? Any phrases that kind of speak to you in that? It's just what we call it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the name we give it. Yeah, just the name, right? The name we give our attempts. I like the word attempts because we're not always successful, right? What else? Anything else in there? Stand out. Least wasted effort. Yes. Do you feel like often you're wasting effort? Uh, oh, no, <laughs> none at all. Yeah. Good. I really like this idea of meaningful rewards, and I like that it's so general because my rewards are different than your rewards. So to me, a reward or on my productive list would be a clean inbox, right? That's a reward for me. Um, or like, I don't know, my yard is all taken care of, right? That's productive or a reward. But that might, might not be a reward for you. So part of productivity is really asking yourself, is the effort that I'm doing giving me the reward that I want, right? Is it, is it giving me the most meaningful reward? Or am I wasting all this effort on something that really isn't that satisfying? I really like that idea of seeking out the most meaningful rewards with the least effort, right? Least wasted effort. So effort is still involved, just the least wasted effort. Any, any other thoughts on this or anything that stands out? Okay, he goes on to say, I like this one too, that productivity is how to succeed with less stress and struggle. It's about getting things done without sacrificing everything we care about. And I, I thought that was much more personal and felt a little more personal, this idea that, that maybe we're being so productive that it's adding stress and struggle, and we're sacrificing things that maybe matter more. And I really identified with this. This last fall, um, I felt that I was really in the midst of the stress and struggle. I'd taken on a lot of responsibility online. I'd been given 165 advanced placement English students in my public school career, and trying to teach them to write was really overwhelming. Um, and so at Christmas, I just thought, I'm not doing the things that I want to do. Right? There's some sacrifice that needs to be made in order to really apply the stress and struggle to what I want to do. And I, I felt that, and so that's why I sort of started on this video. How do I be more productive overall? But that idea, I think, is really important of succeeding with less stress and struggle and not sacrificing what you should. I mean, Is that a copy or a no, but so yes. Yes, agreed. I think it's a typo. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I remember a conference talk at one point. I can't remember if it was over good, better, best, or if it was one like that where he talks about well, it wasn't that one. It was another one. Um, important versus urgent. Yes, and I think. The stress and struggle are the urgent tasks, right? The ones that have a deadline. They're not necessarily the most important things. And it's so easy to get those mixed up. Yeah, and how do you figure out which is which is really tricky, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Great. So if you look at um, the sort of the big ideas, so that's where I'm going to start with um, these four big ideas that are really conceptual. And so they're a little bit harder to put into practice, but I think they're really um, interesting when it comes to productivity and interesting for our students as well. So I'm going to talk about those and then I'll give you some more practical day-to-day -day stuff. Um, so the first one, and the one I think that um, impacted me the most, was that the author talks about reframing your mind so that you see the tasks in front of you as a choice and not a chore. Um, and I think this is so great for our students as well and language that we can use with our students. And, and they did this experiment to see 
how the part of our brain that's connected to motivation, stratium, how that changes when choice is taken away. So they put these people on an MRI machine and they had them play a game. And the game was the number five would flash on the screen and the people would choose whether the next number was going to be higher or lower than five. So they had this choice and were playing this game. Um, and they found that when the people could choose, so they would choose seven or higher, and then it would be a seven, um, this part of their brain lit up, this motivation center, and they were interested and engaged in the game. And then they added a computer player. So every once in a while, the computer would come on and make the choice for them. So they no longer were allowed to, they just watched, right? They just watched the computer say higher, and then it was higher or lower. And that part of the brain uh, no longer lit up and decreased in activity. And so they found that by allowing people choice, the motivation center was more active and lit up. And so they then translated that into things that we do every day. How can we suddenly <coughs> see what we're doing as a choice and not just something that we have to do or sort of this passive uh, response. Um, they then first applied this idea in a new training program in the Marine Corps. So they, they trained the Marines to see the task in front of them as a choice. And how they did that is they had them focus on the why. And I think this is really where we can apply this to our students. So before the Marines climbed this mountain or did this training or exercise, they really had to think about why are you here? Why are you doing this? Why are you putting yourself through this? And come up with some concrete um, ideas or sort of motivation, which then led them to say, I'm choosing to be here because of the why. Right? It's motivating to me to be here because of that why. Um, and the, the general that was sort of overseeing this said that motivation becomes easier when we transform a chore into a choice. To me, so it gives us a sense of control. Um, this idea that we are not just sort of, things aren't just happening to us, but we are a part of that and motivating ourselves to do that. And again, such a great idea for our students. How do you think we can apply this to students? In your courses, where are some ways you can apply this, identifying the why and the, the choice, not a chore, with our students? What do you think? Yeah, bring it back. Um, I think well, with one of uh, my classes, I sometimes they tend to lose motivation. Grammar is not everyone's favorite, which is ridiculous, but right. it's, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, and I so I did a video on why power because I, it made me think of Captain Morone and how when he made the title of Liberty, he didn't give them a pep talk like and dig in there and work harder and try harder. He told them why they were doing it, yes. and that whole section is on why we're fighting and then they went and did something that's not a fun thing to do because they understood why and so um with with my class i often will say just you know make a list of why you're in school or why you need to complete this assignment or for me why would you need to learn how to write because oddly enough you have students who say this is stupid i'm never going to use this you're, you're never going to use English communication, ever, <laughs> in your whole life, yeah. in your job, and where you can't think of a reason. Yeah, absolutely. And so, we, why would you use this? Why is it important to at least sound uh, educated and correct? You don't have to use all the fancy words or all the fancy stuff. But, and when they understand, oh, you know, people, whether it's right or not, will judge you based on how you speak. People yeah. will judge you based on how you write. And it is your problem if it's your boss that's judging you. So. Yeah. And I think, I think the key to this, too, is getting even deeper than just why is this important, but why did you make the choice to come and enroll in this class, and why are you pursuing an education at all, right? The more intrinsic, even I think, is even more powerful. Because you can tell them grammar is important, you know, and show them lots of examples, but until they really identify why am I even taking this class or going to school in the first place, that helps motivate them as well. There was another hand. Yes, Sam. So in English 106, we have speaking partners, and I have had students who have said, I can't believe we're being forced to have a speaking partner. And, and my first response is, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You can choose to, just like any other assignment, you can choose to do the assignment or not do the assignment. Of course, there's a consequence. There's a consequence with doing it and completing every assignment. But just thinking in terms of this, it's, it's, not so, it's not so much the fact that she didn't have a choice that was her issue, but that's, that's how it came out, but that, because that's the way her brain was, was thinking of it. Um, but it's, it's, that's not the issue. The issue is she didn't see the value in it. 
yeah. for herself yet, and so and so find helping them find the value. <coughs> again yeah, and is, again that intrinsic value, right? I tried this with my AP, my advanced placement students who write a lot, and they get really tired of writing. And so, well, you know, this was in February. We're a couple of months in the test, and we're writing an essay. And they they act like I'm torturing them anytime they have to write an in-class essay. They come in and they're just like dragging and they grab their composition books and throw them down on their desk and it's this thing. And so then we talked about, before we wrote the essay, we talked about why are you in this class? Why, why suffer through Shakespeare and the Scarlet Letter, right? Like why, why do that? And they were like, because I have to take an English class. And then we had to push a little deeper and say, advanced placement isn't everybody's choice. Why, what are you trying to accomplish? What credit do you want? Do you want to be a better writer, right? Those types of things. And I found that by having that little pep talk and discussion, maybe didn't produce you know, the, the perfect essays, but I found they were a little bit more receptive to the task instead of just looking at sort of the structure. And so the same thing with my online students who write very long papers, 12-page research papers, and they, they dread this research paper all the way through the semester, but I've tried really hard this semester to really remind them of the why. Why are you going to school? And we have such a diverse population of students who are going to school for so many reasons, and I think that um, that becomes important. Any, any other comments on that idea? Okay, so just going back to this, I thought of just some ways to exercise choice in the things that we do, and some are examples from the text, and if you can think of any others, um, let me know. But um, one example they gave in the book is that when you have a big list of emails to answer and you're dreading this sort of um, 40 emails that you have to respond to, to open each one and write one statement that expresses opinion of control. So you respond with, so for example, I got an email from a student yesterday who didn't turn in a paper and wants an extension. And I've been kind of dreading responding to this email because I get those a lot. Um, and so instead, I just started a draft and I just said something like, you can have till Saturday. He had kidney stones, so I felt like it was a legitimate reason. <laughs> and so then I just left it for a minute and went and answered some other emails and then came back to that email and added the empathy and the other things that I needed to build the email. But it, it seemed to go a little faster when I when I went through and kind of put in these statements of control where I instead of feeling like I had to respond I kind of was more active in responding um, a difficult conversation I have to have to have those with students or instructors online sometimes is my role as an aim so I'll be really careful about choosing the time and place so that even though I feel like oh, I have to call and have this really difficult discussion but I chose the time I chose the place so that I had a little bit of control um, I talked about the writing an essay they say with the to-do list and choosing the to-do list instead of going from top to bottom, picking and choosing from the to-do list so that you have more control instead of feeling like you have all these things to do, I'm choosing to do this right now, I'm choosing to do something else um, that way. I started training for a triathlon, which is a huge goal for me. Um, I did them a long time ago and I really wanted to get back into them. And every day when I go to do one of the three, the run, the bike, or the swim, I have to remind myself of the why. And it is like an internal pep talk, like why are you doing this? Why are you torturing yourself this way? And it really it doesn't make it easier to do, I just seem a little more motivated to do it. So in the end, I think that produces a better product. Any other ideas? Yes. So I have two sons that have both done this job. It's a summer sales job selling security in another state. And my second son was the first one to go out, and they talk about this constantly. Find your why, find your why, find your why. It's become a household joke. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Sorry, not in a bad way, no, but no, like, no, no. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, so my second son that went out, he was earning money for his mission, and he went out, and that was his big why. And so the first oh month and a half or so was going really well, and then they had one big Saturday. Anybody who wanted to participate in this could. They just signed up to do it, and any sales that they made that day went to some charitable. Uh, organization and his supervisor decided that he wanted to put their money to fund my son's mission which is really sweet yeah. and he lost his why <laughs> he sold almost nothing after really? that and he needed to change his why and it needed to become something important enough which he never did but I mean he did so a little bit but nothing like he had done before but Sometimes I think the why changes midway through the 
you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's a powerful phrase that you said. You lost the why, right? Like right. that's that's really. I think we see that happen to students midway, like through the semester and things like that. And, and and it can be really deflating, right? To lose that and we lose that power. So so to recognize that that's happened, that I think is really important to get that back as well. Yeah. Yes. I think that's why Kayla. It's important to in this job is to find our why over and over and over, like coming here yes. to this. I and mean, yes. what a great way to just get enthusiastic and just yes. get going again. And our teaching groups are another way, you know, mm -hmm. just to keep finding that why. So it's important to be involved that way. Yeah, I really felt that way yesterday during President Gilbert's remarks. When he was talking about the different types of students, I was like, oh yeah, that's why I do this, to really help those who maybe wouldn't be here otherwise find their way through. That was really powerful. So yes, thank you. All right, the second big idea is um, about mental models. There we go. Um, so the text talks about how um, our lives have become really automated. And if you think about you know, all the things that are done for us now where we don't have to think, and the doors open by themselves, your phone will you know, direct you to wherever you want to go, um, that that automation is having an impact on our attention span that our attention spans, too, are not as sustainable and as um, as powerful as they used to be. And I find this with my high school students. I feel like I often have to be doing a song and dance to keep them off of their cell phones, right? Because their attention is so, we have the power now to direct our attention to something else, right? We can no longer, we can look at our phones instead of pay attention. And so there's been this impact, which is now called cognitive automation, where our brain will often <coughs> slip into this automatic mode or um, subconsciously determine what to pay attention to and what not to. And errors occur or productivity decreases when we have to quickly toggle from automation to focus. So when you have to sort of power on after being powered off for a while, we start to make errors. Like think about driving a car. You're, you're sort of in this automated mode, something happens and you often overcorrect because you're toggling really quickly from this automation to um, focus. And they give this example of a tragic plane crash in 2009 of a plane that was flying from Rio to Paris. And four hours into the flight, the the tubes, I'm not really great at aerodynamics and, and playing stuff, but uh, the tubes, there were ice crystals in the tubes. And so um, it's a pretty common occurrence that the automatic pilot shuts off and the pilot has to take control until the tubes defrost. And so the pilot, they've been on autopilot for four hours, so automation. The alarm went off, which sort of jolted them into attention. And so we took the controls and just lifted just a little bit. Um, but it was enough that in a really short time, they climbed 3,000 feet and caused a stall in the plane. And so alarms were sounding. There were all these places to pay attention to. But because they had been so stuck on automation, they really tunneled in to just this one problem. And all they had to do was level the plane and the aerodynamics, which would be OK. But the stall happened, and the plane went down and crashed into the ocean, killing everyone on board. And they, they blame it on this idea of like quickly turning from automation to focus. And they give a, a second example of a similar crash where similar things happened. There was an oil fire. Is I, I'm sorry if you're flying in the next. The difference was that the pilot had been using mental models. I'm going to actually switch to this one right here. Um, where on the drive to the airport, he had been asking his crew lots of questions. So he'd been narrating accidents. So he'd said things like, what if we have an engine failure? What will, where will you look? What will you do? And then what will you do? Or what if this happens? And he had been doing that on the way to the plane, or to the airport. And all through the flight, he had been kind of drilling his crew on all of these um, possible accidents and asking them what their reactions would be, so that when something actually did happen, they already had something in place. And they call that reactive thinking. I'm going to flip right back to this one really quick. Um, where where um, athletes do this all the time, where they build these habits so that when something happens, you react. But if we don't have these mental models in place, we don't have these scenarios already set out, then our reactive thinking often <coughs> is an error, right? We're reacting too quickly or we're not, we're cognitive tunneling where we focus on the wrong thing. Um, so they say that you should start narrow or narrating your life all the time so that your brain, which is like a spotlight, never powers down. 
So for example, right now, instead of sort of passively listening as your brain kind of powers down, you would be thinking these like, what if they called on me to contribute to the discussion? What would I say? And sort of keeping your brain awake all the time um, or predicting what will happen in a meeting with your boss or sort of always keeping that brain awake. And I really like this idea with our students because my students power down all the time, right? They, they stop working or stop thinking in between assignments or things like that when really we've got to keep ourselves going so that the spotlight never powers down. So you tell yourself stories about what's going on as it occurs, um, sort of as a prediction. I do this in my classroom with my seniors all the time. What if this kid does this? What will I do? What if someone comes in my classroom that I don't know or recognize, which is scary thinking, but things that I think through all the time. So it's this idea of developing our habit of telling ourselves stories about what's going on around us. We learn to sharpen where our attention goes when that in, when something happens really quickly. Any ideas how to apply this to our students? How can we keep them powered up instead of sort of shutting down all the time? My students write uh, big essays, as I said, and they write pieces along the way, so they don't write it all in one, in one day. And I try really hard to direct their focus to each paragraph and not say, don't just use this as a throwaway assignment. This is a piece of the whole, right? So keeping them engaged all the way through, maybe that's a way to apply this for sure. Yeah? I think um, just, you know, what what do you do if you, I mean, if you get sick and you can't anticipate it, but thinking ahead, what if yes. I do get sick? Am I so deathly ill that I can't let my instructor know? Um, you know, that I'm going to be at uh, finishing probably for a couple of days. Yeah, just having them think ahead so that it doesn't surprise them, uh, and you don't hear from them for a week and a half, and, 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 then and you're asking for, for yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great stations. idea, sort of presenting these scenarios of what might happen. Absolutely. Fantastic. Such a, such a great idea to keep our brains going. Okay, um, you look what else is in this book, your favorite smart goals. <laughs> they are, are actually, there's a lot of research, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on smart goals because we are experts at smart goals, but I just want to reiterate that the, the text talks about the power of smart goals um, and actually introduces a different term called stretch goals. I don't know, I'm going to skip this because you know what the smart stands for. Um, but stretch goals are um, goals that seem out of reach. So the most effective productivity comes when you pair a stretch goal with a SMART goal. So uh, a lot of companies do this. They'll set really out of reach um, goals or criteria and then ask their employees to meet them through setting smaller SMART goals. And so um, maybe this year, as you set your SMART goals, think of something that you want to accomplish that's really far out of reach and how will a SMART goal get you closer? So for example, this goal of me accomplishing a, a triathlon is a stretch goal for me, right? It's way out of reach. But I've found that by setting a monthly SMART goal of how much distance I need to run, how much swimming I need to do, how much I need to bike, the goal gets closer and closer along the way. So pairing them together really helps um, us get to those sort of big ideas a little bit better. So, Stretch goals serve as jolting events that disrupt complacency and promote new ways of thinking. I really like that, like setting these big ideas that really push us towards something, but then pairing them with the SMART goals helps a lot. Um, they say write to-do lists that pair stretch and SMART goals together. So the stretch goal goes at the top, and then the SMART goal, you break it down into concrete steps, and how do we then achieve the stretch goal through the SMART goal system? Yes. I just in one of my feedback because my, my students do so many smart goals in a row and uh, his name is Brendan he's a motivational speaker on YouTube mm -hmm. and he talks about dumb goals and he goes I'm sick and tired of doing smart goals over and over again and achieving nothing yes. and he says but smart goals have their place but we have to have he, he had an acronym for dumb as well and it wasn't dumb it was like you know like something big that you think you could never achieve and he's like Martin Luther King didn't have you know little smart goals he had this big Thing that was out of reach, but then you put those into place, just like you say. The kids really liked that. Yeah, it's such a great idea because we all have these big ideas, but they seem so unattainable. But using the smart goal system, I mean, this quote right here is having ambition and a system for figuring out how to make it into a concrete and realistic plan. And that's what the smart goal system will do. So I like this idea of stretch goals and, and making us more productive by giving us a path to get to them. Absolutely. Any, any other ways we can apply this idea to students? 
My final paper is a stretch goal for students. They get into the class and they're like, 12 page research paper, 12 sources, how will I ever get there? And I have to keep reminding them, well, you're gonna write two smaller papers before, and you research along the way, showing them that this system is sort of already set up to help them get there, so they don't feel so overwhelmed by the end goal and the end task. Are there other thoughts on that? Okay, so go to the last big idea, which is decision making, and I found this one the most interesting. Um, the text talks a lot about how productive people make good decisions really quickly, and how do you then um, become someone who does that, who can make really quick decisions and effective decisions in, in a way. So they talk about how good decision makers have one characteristic. They have the ability to envision or forecast the future. So if you think about decision making, it really is about envisioning the future. So a couple years ago, I was looking at whether or not I should buy a house, and that's a big decision. So I had to think into the future. Can I afford to pay the mortgage? Will I be able to handle the maintenance? You know, will I like living kind of on my own? And I had to look into the future and kind of think about what my life would be like owning this house, right? Having this house. But the trick is that the future is not certain, right? I can think that I'll have a job in two years, but the economy may change and, and it may not, right? So things may change. So good decision makers can forecast the future, but also be comfortable with doubt. So this idea that like, yes, I have this idea that things will work out, but it may not, and be comfortable making the decision in spite of that, right? So being comfortable with that doubt. And the way to do that, they talk about is um, gaining a ability to measure things probabilistically, which is this idea of what we think will happen or want to happen and what is more likely to occur. So the more you can get those closer together, like um, what we think will happen is that I will be able to pay my mortgage and that I'll be able to take care of my house. Is that really likely what's going to happen? And, and how I build that probability, I hope I'm explaining this well enough, is that I learn from life experience. So I look around at all the people around me who have been able to pay a mortgage and maintain a house who are in my similar situation, and I use that to weigh my sort of decision making, and yeah, I think I can do that because so-and-so did it, or someone else did it this way. And, and so the more life experience you have, and the more understanding of people's successes and failures help you build that base to make decisions based on their experiences. Does that make sense? So, so they say, um, Next time you hear about someone who didn't get a promotion, ask them why and sort of build that knowledge base. Or next time you're angry at your spouse, instead of saying, I'll just do better next time, really think about what prompted that in the situations and build that base so that when the decisions come, you have more to use in your statistics of decision making, ultimately. Um, and your ability to forecast the future will be based on all this other knowledge. So it's a big concept and I'm, I'm kind of just brushing it lightly, but it's such a cool idea that that good decision making is about predicting the future, being comfortable that it may not work out, and using others um, to, to sort of gauge that decision making. This happens with our students all the time, right? They don't always make the best decisions, and helping them process the decision will help them make a better decision next time. So when our students miss a paper or you know, go on a trip and forget to take their laptop and can't turn in their assignments or whatever it is, right? Kind of walking through this decision with them and saying maybe next time, we do this instead, and helping them build that base so they can make better decisions in the future. Any, any other thoughts on this one? Yeah. Or ideas? Okay, so those are the kind of the four big ideas, again, kind of conceptual, but I think can help change behavior. Um, I have just a couple smaller ideas of things that I've found that um, help me be more productive. Um, and the first is I stopped wearing busy as a badge of honor. Um, I don't know if that's something that you do as well, but um, for a long time I felt that my identifying characteristic, whenever anybody would ask me how I was, I would say busy. And I took some pride in that, and I really had to reevaluate, is that how I want to be known as busy? And, and I found that that wasn't how I wanted to be known, or I didn't want my, my parents to be telling family members, oh, she's just so busy, and I thought, I'm doing all these other things, I'm not just busy. Um, and so I stopped. It was kind of a, it's kind of a soul-searching activity where you think, why, why do I get this pride in listing off all the things that I have to do, or, or why is that part of my self-esteem, and so how can I reroute that a little bit so that I stop sort of 
advertising all the time that I'm missing. So I don't necessarily think that's how I want it to be known. So, so maybe that's one way to sort of change your mindset a little bit. Any, any thoughts on that? Anybody else fall into that trap a little bit? Again, I've got some more nodding. Um, <laughs> another thing to do is really determine your productive time. So for me, my productive time is mornings, particularly 6 to 7.30 in the morning. Um, my first high school class starts at 7.30. So I found if I get to school by 6 in the morning, I get more done in an hour and a half than I do the rest of the day. And I don't have to talk to anybody. I don't like students coming in during that time. My door is usually shut. Um, but I found that that's my productive time. So identifying your productive time and really utilizing that, whether that's midnight to 2 a.m right whatever it is um, but making that work so for me to make my productive time work I have to get to bed on time right I have to make sure that I'm ready for the day and things like that to really honor that productive time um, the other thing they talk about is limiting your digital clutter that digital clutter really clogs productivity and digital clutter looks like um, 150 emails in your inbox so every time you open it up you kind of you feel that anxiety of like I have so many things to do, um, and I really try to use my inbox as my to-do list. So whatever is in there are things I'm still working on or replies I need to do. But once I've replied, once I've dealt with it, it goes into a folder, and, and it may still be there, but at least it seems organized, right? It seems in a good place. Um, another thing I would highly recommend is not having your email come to your cell phone um, because it's really hard to separate your life a little bit if all the time I made that change both with my school and BYU Idaho emails because I felt like even though I was telling myself I'm not working right now if an email came I was always working and so it was really important for me to separate personal life with work life and that was something the ease of that automation really was clogging me up a little bit um, so that's something I would recommend um, that helps Another term is called workstation popcorn, which is instead of spending 10 minutes on social media, jumping in and answering two emails and not telling yourself, I have to answer all of these emails, but just popping in one or two things and slowly over time those will get done. Or you have 10 minutes, jump in and grade five assignments. And that's all you can do in that 10 minutes and that's fine, but over time those 10 minutes will accumulate. So using that small increment of time to pop in and do tasks over time. Um, this other quote is a quote by John Wooden. It says, uh, be quick but don't worry. I really like that idea or that concept of moving quickly through things but not in a way where things are done sloppily or um, are not polished but in a way where you can just get them done a little bit quicker. And I'm sure there's a lot of ways to work on that but I, but I like that idea of be quick but don't worry. Um, there's power in rituals. So going through the same process uh, every day so you start work by checking your emails and then you grade assignments and then you you know do announcements for the next week but the idea is that the more you do something over and over the faster you get at it so if you have these sort of rituals the productivity will increase um, i'm a big advocate of the power of no um, we tend to take on a lot i think as teachers particularly i'm really interested in why teachers are often martyrs particularly in the public education system i've been thinking about that a lot how we just take on a lot of stuff and, and sometimes that does some damage um, and, and we need to just say no, right? And, and it will be okay, that fear of disappointing others will decrease and it gets better over time. Um, and then the last one is really having some protected time. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on being an introvert in an extroverted job and how that sort of impacts myself and I've found that um, I have to have some protected time to recharge, particularly after teaching all day um, at the high school. I have to go home for an hour and just not have anybody need anything from me or anything. I have a hammock in my backyard and it's like my special place, right? Nobody needs anything. Um, but So that's why I think part of productivity is just powering down for a minute and letting yourself recover from all of the energy that you've expended throughout the day and really protecting that time and not feeling selfish or that you are um, should be doing something else because you're, you're you need that or at least I know that I need that. So any other ideas or things that work for you to help you be more productive? Uh, Hopefully a few of those helps. We'll just end with um, this quote from Albert Dorf, um, which reminds us 
of the ultimate productivity is building the gospel. And strength comes not from frantic activity, but from being settled on a firm foundation of truth and light. It comes from placing our attentions and efforts on the, base, uh, the basics of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. It comes from paying attention to the, to the divine things that matter most. And that reminds me of what he said Stacey about really figuring out what we value and how that's connected to um, what we really need. And, and I say those things, maybe just